Okay, welcome everybody to the second part of this week's lecture and now we are going to talk about psychophysics. Okay, let's come on. So these are just very old equipment of psychophysical experiments. So again, let's start with a quick video clip from the Big Bang Theory, which I really loved to watch a while ago and got a little bit boring towards the end. Um, let's have a look, an introduction into that. What's wrong? I've made a horrible mistake. What are you talking about? This table. It's in square centimeters. I read it as square meters. Do you know what that means? That Americans can't handle the metric system? <laughs> Amy, I was off by a factor of 10,000. But the Chinese team found the element. Yeah, well, they shouldn't have. My calculations were wrong. There must be some resonance between the elements I didn't know about. So you just got lucky? Sheldon Cooper does not get lucky. <laughs> you and me both, brother. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The element was found because of you, and that's groundbreaking. Yeah, what matters is the greatest scientific achievement of my life is based on a blunder. Look, I'm not a genius. I'm a fraud. You know, Sheldon, in neuroscience, we're forever finding something in one part of the brain that we thought was someplace else. Oh, great. Now I'm worse than a fraud. I'm practically a biologist. <laughs> so, yeah, with this attitude, I'm not sure what Sheldon would have thought of the concept of psychophysics, where you may ask whether it's a merger of physics and psychology. And in a way, it actually is. Because psychophysics is the study of the relationship between the physical stimuli, that's where the physics component comes from, and their perception, which is then the psychological component of that. And you might say that quite a bit of psychology or the, the, um, the rise in experimental psychology has really uh, one, one part of the foundation is in psychophysics to find out exactly this relationship. And in psychophysics, we can ask three very central questions, main questions. The first one is about the absolute threshold, or also called detection threshold. So how strong does a stimulus need to be so that I can detect it? And you may know these tests, hearing tests, so where you have very faint sounds and you have to say, yes, I heard a sound or didn't hear a sound, press a button. The relative threshold, so if you have two stimuli, um, and they differ in their strength, how much do they have to differ so that you can just note the difference between them? And then the question of scaling. So if you increase the stimulus in its physical strength, what is the increase in perceived st strength? Let's go through these three things a little bit slower, step by step. Okay, so detection threshold. What is the minimum strength of the physical stimulus stimulation so that we notice its presence? And here is a graph as an example for the absolute auditory threshold. And I picked this graph because it illustrates that the thresholds can be quite variable. So different lines are for different people and they just illustrate. So here on the x-axis you have the frequency so on the left side, it's rather low frequency, deep sounds, and here is rather high frequency, high pitched sounds. And here we have the sound pressure in decibel, which is just basically the strength of the auditory stimulus. And the different lines are for different people. And they are just, uh, you know, this one is for 20 year old, 30 year old, and they're just examples. So, um, and what you see is a couple of things. First of all, the threshold differs quite a bit between people. So something one pers person can still perceive is unperceivable, undetectable for another person. Again, this is important to remember if you work in something like product design. Second one is that the threshold actually depends on the nature of the stimulus. So low frequency stimuli we need less loud stimuli or less energy 
than for higher pitched stimuli. You need a stronger stimulus to perceive it. So you can't just simply test something and then necessarily generalize to a stimulus of a different quality or nature. And in particular, what these lines also suggest is that with age we lose sensitivity. So person characteristics are relevant here as well. <clears throat> the relative threshold, often abbreviated as J and D, just noticeable difference, uh, is the smallest detectable difference between two stimuli. So, oh yeah, I said that already with the J and D. A person who's really important here is Ernst Weber. And you can see he, this work on psychophysics was done at a time where really the very first steps in psychology, experimental psychology, cognitive psychology have been made. So this is one of the bases. And Weber worked on these relative thresholds and proposed a law, the Weber law, or Weber's law, which looks like this. And even for those of you who hate formulas or any mathematical things, it's quite easy to understand this equation. Okay, what does it mean? So I is the intensity of a stimulus, the first stimulus, and delta I is the difference in intensity of the second stimulus. And the difference, the just noticeable difference, I need to say these two stimuli are different. And it says that the relationship of these two is constant, k, we was constant. And right from the start it was already proposed that it's roughly constant. So it's not like a mathematical precision here. So what does it mean in real life? What it means is that if you have two things, and let's say you have two weights, and one is 100 gram, and to detect the difference, the other needs to be at least 10 gram heavier. So it needs to be at least 110 grams. And you have them in your hands. 100 grams is roughly a normal bar of chocolate. Then it says if you increase that, so I would be 100 grams and delta I is 10 grams more. So 110 grams is the second stimulus. Now let's say the intensity of stimulus 1 is 1 kilogram. So you multiply it by 10. What it tells you, so that this is constant, the difference needs to be multiplied by 10 as well. So I can just notice the difference between 100 and 110 gram. However, I can't notice the difference between 1000 gram and 1010 gram the just noticeable difference will be a thousand gram and roughly one thousand one hundred gram. So it just scales up. And this is probably something you notice from your everyday life. If you have two very light things, you can detect a better difference as compared to very heavy things. If you go to vacation and you have two heavy suitcases, it must be quite a difference in weight so that you say one is heavier than the other one. You wouldn't notice hundred or two hundred gram. But if you have two letters you want to send, it might very well be that you say, OK, this one is only 100 and this is twice the weight, 200 grams. That is Weber's law. There is an application of Weber's law actually in marketing. And this is that a general marketing rule is that if you want to decrease the quality or value of your product, you should stay below this difference people will notice. This is, doesn't have to do something with physics but uh, or physical stimuli but with perception in the sense. And a couple of years ago in the UK Toblerone changed the change of their chocolate bars to put less chocolate in there. And they made it in a way that it was very evident and obvious to people. And this made the number one in the most read BBC news on their homepage. And I just noticed today, a couple of days ago, Trump handed over to Biden. And this was four years ago when um, Trump and Clinton were running for office. So time flies.
But just to show you, that was a very, very unwise move of Toblerone. They should have tried to make it in a way that people don't notice the difference. On the other hand, if you want to improve a product, you have to make sure that it's above this notable difference, so that people actually realize it has improved. Because when you stay below it, you spend more money, um, but without any effect, because people don't notice that. Another example is in product design. Think about cars and their brake lights. You have to make sure that the brake lights are bright enough and you know they you have the regular rear lights and then the brake lights are just red which is brighter. That this difference is strong enough so that the car behind you um just notice that. Okay, let me just adjust the settings here of my uh, camera because the sun went away so I think I'm getting a little bit dark now on the image yeah okay did you notice the difference <laughs> that wasn't planned okay so examples of the just notice noticeable difference scaling the last bit in psychophysics just very briefly and here the question is how does our perceived intensity changes when the physical stimulus changes. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, it's usually not linear. You can rephrase this question is, how much do we need to change the physical stimulus so that we perceive a doubled intensity? And for instance, for light, it's absolutely not linear because we are able to perceive such a huge range of lightness if you think about the night or just at dusk or dawn we have very very little light available and at the blazing midday sun there's a huge difference so to perceive a doubled intensity uh, the physical stimulation in light has to not double, it has to quadruple, and I think it's actually a logarithmic or exponential scale or something like that. So, um, it's it's not linear. Okay, um, again, there is a demonstration, or not again, um, there is a demonstration which we used to do in, uh, in the lecture theater, and which worked quite nicely there, but I know that you're sitting at home now, and but maybe you have people around you, you can try that with if you want to. You don't have to. I can talk you through that as well. And the task is that, um, or the point is, you need two people to do that. It doesn't work by yourself and alone. And I want to play, or I want you to play tit for tat. You know, maybe there's this little game of children. One taps or pushes the other one, and the other one goes back and so forth. So, but I want you to do that in a very controlled and attentive context. So, suppose you have these two people, person A and person B. And person A slightly taps B, something like that. You know, not too strong. And person B now tries to feel, so to perceive, the exact intensity of that tap. If you want to, you can close your eyes to better feel into your hand. And then, when you have felt that, you try to return the tap with exactly the same intensity. So try to do it as good as possible. And then, now you reverse that, and person A tries to feel or perceive the exact intensity of that tap. And then, you go back and try to do, reproduce that. So you go back and forth, and you always try to really focus on the perception and try to recreate the exact string, same tap with the same strength and intensity. So, what you should not assume is that all taps have always equal intensity. Just try to reproduce exactly what you have felt. Okay? Now, um... Yeah, just important, don't let it escalate. If it gets too strong or something, then, then just stop it, obviously. And see and try to observe um, what happens here. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Um, if you have somebody around in your household or something where you want to do it, just pause the video now 
and do it now and notice what happens. Okay, what most people, if you continue now, have you continued or haven't done it, what most people will realize that even with this controlled instruction where you really try your best to be as accurate as possible and reproduce the same thing, that the intensity increases over time and gets stronger and stronger. So, what did we learn from that exercise, from that observation? Which is not, which doesn't hold for everybody, so don't worry if you get a different result, but on average that happens to, I would say, roughly three quarters of the people from the feedback when we did it in class before. And the key point to learn, and which has been published here in this science paper quite a few years ago now, is that the perception of the sensory event is different for our own actions and for the actions of others. So technically, the pressure is always the same. And in this paper, they I think they tried with different people, but also with like a proper mechanical device, which has just a controlled level of force, so that you can't argue about perception, you know the actual force values which have been used. And it happens in a way that our own actions are perceived less intense than the actions of others. So when I tap you, it feels less intense as compared when you tap me. So agency plays a role in perception. And this is really a very good and strong illustration of how we interpret our perception. Okay, the reason for this effect is that our system, internal system, already expects the effects of our own uh, actions. And this is done, uh, it has several reasons why it's done, and um, one reason is that we are not overwhelmed with the perceptual input of our own actions, because this perceptual input is not that important. If I know I want to grasp a glass of water, I don't need to be informed, okay, something is touching my hands. Of course, I do need to know that, but not in the sense of, careful, somebody touched here, look whether this is something dangerous, like when something else touches me. Then I should put my attention there and see whether it's maybe in the harm, most harmless way, uh, just something, a leaf which brushed me when I was walking, or whether it maybe is a mosquito or maybe a snake or something like that. So if something else touches me where I don't expect it, it might be potentially dangerous. So I have to be more aware of that. And to make the distinction easier, when we do something, our brain sends out a signal already to the perceptual areas which dampens down, which reduces the level of uh, signal which comes through to our perception. Okay, that's also an explanation why we usually can't tickle ourselves, because the perception of that is less intense when we tickle ourselves as compared to somebody else, because we already take away some of this tickling sensation. Another area where this has been used as a potential explanation is in schizophrenia. And the point is that people may have a deficit in this area so that own actions are not felt less intense. And because they are not felt less intense and they don't have this mechanism, what happens is that their own actions may be felt like the actions of somebody else from an outside agent. And w this may support or give rise to these feelings of paranoia. Somebody else is watching me and, and doing st things to me, hallucinations and these types of things. This is definitely not the whole picture in schizophrenia, but it may be a contributing factor in that. It may explain that. And also, if you have children or ever will have children or work with children, when their tit-for-tat play escalates, be aware it's not necessarily because they are uh, 
have some some ill intentions against the other ones like you hit me i hit you back stronger i mean that may be part of it but not necessarily it may be just an innocent game be which escalates because of that effect that at some point somebody says suddenly that was too strong you did hurt me and maybe it was just by accident okay um again if you have any questions post them on the BBL discussion forum or take them to the seminars. Thanks a lot for watching and listening and see you soon for the next part in this perception lecture in cognitive psychology.